Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Every week, I say I'm going to do a better job of getting the show out, but <laughs> a lot of stuff happens between now and then. So, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and I should have a lot to say about that. Still kind of mixed out there, but very interesting. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. And when we get to the live charts, you can ask about whatever you want. You could also ask about your favorite stock picks then. For your benefit, ask about one at a time and then hit return. And if you're watching a recording of this and you want to come to the live show, DaveLeonard.com slash webinar. Love to have you. So I want to continue my discussion on doing trading stuff. And this week I added or not. And there's a plethora of other random thoughts on trading, including intraday ETFs, IPOs, and volatility. And what I think might be one of the secrets to trading. We'll get to that. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hang around my office. You'll hear a lot of F-bombs. <laughs> Last week, we talked about this guy in his T-shirt, so I'm not going to bore you and go through all the details. But after seeing it, it did get me thinking about trading and how I've been doing a lot of trading stuff lately. And in some cases, not a lot of trading stuff. And again, we'll get to that. So I want to continue along that theme. Now, Monday, we came in, as you know, and the market had a big gap down. What's kind of interesting is I don't think we came back as much as this chart shows on the spiders. But we did have a late day bounce, and that's what I want to talk about. So I came in, and whether I did the right thing or not, but I'm in here pre-market, and I'm watching the market kind of come unglued, and I'm watching my long, my core positions get decimated. So I decided to go in and short some S&P futures pre-market, just in case we had a gap and go situation, and look to flip them out somewhere around the open. Well. I survived the open and flipped them out probably about 30, 40 minutes later. And then the rest of them stopped out for a similar gain. I forget exactly what it was, 20 or 30 points, which is better than the poke on. So it turned out to be a gap and a go. We had a little retrace and the market dropped again. I don't think I caught that second leg down, but I was kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the opening gap reversal. And it really didn't come until late, late, late in the day and it was a exercise in patience. I waited and waited and waited and waited and finally around one o'clock or so Eastern, I went ahead and put an order in one of my accounts to buy the SPXL at 1280 or better. And my reasoning was it looked like it was due to reverse, due to bounce and after I put the order in, it began to find a lot of support. So I was talking with one client and he knew I was trying to play these intraday ETFs. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, a lot more detail in a few minutes. Anyway, I said, hey, I have an order on my IRA on SPXL at 102.80, one point stop for what it's worth. And what I was waiting for is the big squeeze, which took forever to happen. And blink, if you if you would have blinked, you would have missed, missed it because it was the last few minutes of trading. And I was explaining to him, don't get aggressive on the long side until the hook is in, which hasn't happened yet, maybe later in the day or maybe late in the day. And he wanted to know what does that mean? Wait until it's upside momentum. Yeah, to some extent, yeah. When you've got a market that's just absolutely decimated like this, and then it's kind of bouncing around at low levels, if it begins to rally, what happens is all the shorts tend to rush to cover at the same time. And then, of course, a few bottom fishers rush in, and you can get this big pop late in the day. So don't be a hero when you have a big gap lower, because sometimes you have a gap and go, and sometimes you have to go with the gap and go as I'm going to show you in just one second, and it doesn't turn into that beautiful opening gap reversal. And in this particular case, I actually had forgotten that I bought them because I was so busy getting out of everything else 
that I ended up exiting in after hours. But luckily, when I saw how everything was strong and realized that I had an accident, I was like, well, it's probably strong enough to where I could still get out and exit after hours and do okay. Okay, so Gush, looking at a daily chart, you can see Gush gapped open on the 21st from very low levels or relatively low levels, I should say. And it's like gap and go or an ogre, an opening gap reversal. In this particular case, we know in complete hindsight, it turned into an ogre. So you kind of have to make that, or you do have to make that go or no go decision when you get a gap higher like this. You got to be careful though, and, and people say, Dave, do you wait 15 minutes? It's like, well, sometimes you wait 15 minutes, but if the market is rallying and rallying and rallying and rallying, sometimes your hand is forced and you have to go with the trade. Now, in this particular case, because the opening gap held, I began to think, okay, if this thing takes out new lows for the day, I might need to think about shorting. And in this case, since you can't short gush, you'd have to buy a drip. And if it began to rally, I'm going to think about going long. Well, it did begin to rally, and it tailed higher. And as I was thinking about getting in, it came off its best levels a little bit, fortunately, at least shorter term. So I said, you know what? If it could break out above that range, it might be worth a shot. And it's something like, gosh, you're going to have to give it three points at least because it could bounce around quite a bit. In fact, that open range bar was what, 69, point and a half, almost two points. Pretty impressive rally just in one bar. So three points above would be right around where you see that green line above. There's the actual trade, only 100 shares. That's, that's enough because that's, if you're risking three points, it's $300. And I think this account's probably about 100K. So you're looking at about a third of a percent for intraday trade. So you don't want to bet the form in these type of things. And it did rally and trigger, and it didn't really do a whole lot at first. But fortunately, it did make it to the IPT. And then for the rest of the day, mostly sideways, but it did trade on both sides of profitability or, or as far as giving up profits. And the stop... Once you hit that initial profit target, by the way, notice this line turned red here. The stop, once you're at the IPT, your stop has moved to break even. Now, it'll actually get there a little sooner, and I'll show you one in just one second where that actually happened. So as it moves in your favor, if you put in two orders, one for the IPT for half, and then the other for a trailing stop for half, in this case, plus three, minus three, respectively, then sometimes you could go about your life, I know, haha, good luck with that, and forget about it and just let it play out. So when I'm doing these intraday trades, I'm not in and out, in and out, in and out like the rabbit, the rabbit, the rat hitting the button for the cocaine. I want to get in as early as possible. In this case, within the first 20-something minutes of trading, and I wrote it all day long. And that's the ultimate goal What with these things. And you exit market on close. Now, I'm showing you some day trades here. I don't want you to think I'm going day trade crazy. But I'm here anyway. And a lot of times I feel like these opportunities present themselves. And I just want to show you what I'm up to. Sox L was one of those cases where the first 15 minutes was the crux of the whole move. And if you waited and waited and waited, you might have been frozen and not been able to get in at higher levels. And this was kind of an interesting situation. So in this case, I only did 200 shares. And then I had a plus or minus one point for the initial profit target and the trailing stop. And the entry, what happened was the entry was, as you see it around 40, and I, I got filled right at 40, and I was only using a one-point trail and stop, one-point initial profit target. And you could see that it came really close to tagging that initial profit target. I think I was off at breakfast. I'm not saying watch the screen all day long and you can't have breakfast. Maybe put an alert 
to know where you're getting fairly close. And in this particular case, I probably should have taken profits then. But what happened was when I got back from breakfast or I got alert at breakfast, I noticed that I had gotten knocked out of 100 shares. And in a case like this, I get ready to exit the remainder of the shares. It does take a little bit of discipline. But every now and then you get lucky and that turns out to be a reversal. And then at the end of the day, I ended up getting out of the shares. And once again, it's kind of interesting. The crux or, or the, the a big part of the rally happened late in the day. And really nothing happened almost the entire day long. So there's the trades, how they shook out down there. You can see 100 shares for a scratch. And then it made a tiny bit on the remainder. I think it was 185 on the remainder. So it's better than the poke in the eye. 178, I think, was the uh, trade overall for the day. So LabVIEW began to rally. This was also on the 21st. 21st was a really interesting day. So I had a little tiny rally coming into the day, and then it began to implode. Now, part of the lesson here is not that you want to wait the entire 15 minutes. And by the way, in case you're wondering, a while back, by complete accident, I went to 15 minute bars from five minute bar. I used to always use, use five minute bars my whole life. And I was getting chewed up really bad in S&P futures. I know I've told the story a thousand times, but anyway, then one day I didn't get a trade, didn't get a trade, didn't get a trade. I'm not sure if I got a trade all day. And then maybe late today I got a trade, made a little money. And the next day it didn't get a trade all day. And maybe late in the day, once again, got a trade. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong? And then I realized that it switched from five minute bars to 10 minute, 15 minute bars. And my life got a lot easier. I found myself chasing my tail. By the way, if I ever find myself on a one minute bar, I know something's wrong and I'm in trouble. <laughs> so it began to implode. So I feel like, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, okay, I, I dodged a bullet on this one by not getting too excited and jumping in this tiny little, I guess, lap higher or gap higher because it soon turned around and imploded. So always give them at least a little wiggle room if you're going to go after a gap and go. Now, this is what it looks like on a daily chart. And again, this is 100% hindsight, but I will tell you this. Watching a daily chart will help you if you're trying to do an intraday trade like this, okay? And, and what I'm trying to do with these intraday trades, again, I'm trying to get in and stay in all day. And I'm trying to generate, and I hate these word income, and I'm trying to generate some income while the core methodology works. And the downside to this, and I think I've said this a few times, is if you have a losing day and your core methodology has a losing day, then it becomes a double whammy and psychologically it's pretty tough. There's also a cost of doing all this and it's not just the cost of doing the transactions, which there's no cost in that anymore to speak of, but the cost is a mental energy cost. And when I'm when I'm in a state of flow, and I would recommend, I'm trying to think of the name of the book, I think it's called Flow, Mahaley, Chickson, Mahaley or whatever, I'm, He's got a name about that long, but I think the first name is Mahaley. Google Flow, and you'll see the book. And uh, it's also an audio book format, too. But anyway, when things are going well, I'm in a state of flow. I put on all these positions, and I can stay busy the rest of the day working and just every now and then glance over out of curiosity with this stuff. But when I when I struggle with it is it's when things aren't working, I find I struggle a lot and it's like nothing works. So it seems like most of them work or none of them work. So figuring out how to only trade on the days when things work, I'll own the world. And I'm working on that and I'll show you a few things in just one second. So there was a couple things that were going through my mind and in my trading journal, I try to write down what I'm thinking at the time so I can go back and look at it and whether or not I'm stressed out or whether or not there's FOMO involved. And at the end of the day, I have a spreadsheet where I track whether or not I had FOMO or recreational trading or, or things like that, how much energy I have, how's my focus. And you really have to manage all these things and, and not to compare to a professional athlete, believe me. <laughs> But it's kind of like a professional athlete. They do all these things to make sure they're operating at peak performance. And I think that 
we need to do them too. And I think that a lot of life is energy management. And it was, what's his name? I got it right. Well, I can see the book. Uh, Scott Adams wrote a book. I think it's how to fail at pretty much everything. I don't know if I can read it from here and still succeed. And he talks a lot about energy management. So I'd recommend you read that. But that's one of the dangers of doing any sort of intraday trading, like the Russian dolls we've been talking a lot about lately. And this type of stuff, and then maybe add-on trades with, that you flip it in and out of, around uh, trading around the core methodology. You have to be really careful, and you also have to be careful getting back to the actual trades of not chasing your own tail. And I'm working harder to keep a daily chart up of every one of these that I might be interested in, which I'll show you in a few minutes, to make sure that I'm not getting excited about the rally or or a huge sell-off, which turns out to be just a just noise alone. But anyway, I ended up buying LabU after it rallied and hit my entry. So I figured it imploded so much, I could put in an entry right above the high. And if it triggers, it triggers. And if memory serves, I was I had this, I literally had this order in place, and I was actually looking at lab D just in case it'd be a trade there but i left this order in place and then once this begins to reverse i realized that okay maybe this might actually work so your job is to get on the right side of the market and one thing i was thinking about and this type of trading is a little bit more advanced than i like to get into with the trading simplified show but one reason i might mention it there is because if you are trading these ETFs and inverse ETFs, it really helps you to see both sides of the market. And you really become kind of flippant in that you don't care. As long as it goes up or as long as it goes down, you just don't care, right? It's just got to go one way or the other and by a somewhat significant amount. So that was the lab you trade. Now, I happened to have this screen up when I was putting my slides together. And I'm not going to go through all the indicators on here, but essentially I'm looking for narrow range bar days and then looking for an expansion of volatility. That's kind of a Toby Crable type of thing. And an HG day, ideally you want an HG seven day. That's the widest range in seven days. And it also starts at one end and ideally ends at the other. I don't have it coded to do that perfectly, but if it's a wide range bar day and it starts at one end and goes down quite a bit, I know that with money management, I should be able to get a trade out. But here's a really good good example here, a little HD5, little thumbs up. So this is the widest range out of the last five bars. You can see it starts at the top, at the high here, a little lap open, and then it does not really take out that high very much, okay? So a day like this, for instance, where it kind of opens and shoots up and then shoots down and closes up, it's all over the place. Plus it's a fairly narrow range. You can't make any money on a day like that. But anyway, what I noticed was, as I was looking at this, it's like, wow, we've had quite a few HG days and a couple of wide range bar days too, a WRB7. And you'll see right there. And that's not a holy grail day because this open is not within 10% of the high. So you could have gotten faked out on this one on that little bit of a rally. But I thought it would be fun, I know you probably want to party with me, to go in and see how I did on those days. Because if I did poorly, then shame on me, because conditions were conducive for this type of trading. Now, of course, as Murphy would have it, we got an HG5 day while I was traveling and unable to take that particular trade. Now, the following day after I got back from vacation, if you want to call it that, yeah, it was a vacation. It's more vacation than normally take, but I had, of course, I had a laptop with me. But on that particular day, on this HD5 day, it wasn't feasible because I was actually traveling. But anyway, the next day, it's a wide range bar day. And I looked up and thank goodness, I did make a little money on that day. And then I looked at this other little HG5 day, which looks phenomenal, and I did okay on that day too. In fact, I did more than okay based on the account size. So I thought it would be kind of cool to just jump in and grab those trades. 
And I see that I did do some of this short dated options trading. Now, this is something that's a little bit more advanced that I want to get into tonight. But essentially what an option is, can the option move far enough within the given time period to make trading it worthwhile? And on these ETFs, I'm looking at the weeklies for those that do have weeklies. And I was thinking, you know, if I'm going to trade this outright, I'm going to have to use a two or three point stop. And if I can get an option for 50 cents, that's pretty close to the money. That might be worth a shot. So that's why in this particular case, I ended up buying those options. And I kind of doubled up by buying stock and by buying options. And my thought was that it would give me the luxury of flipping out should the stock move well in my favor. And if I got stopped out, then maybe I might want to hang on to those options just in case. Now, that's a little bit further than I want to get into with options. But the bottom line is, ask yourself, would it be worth buying the option so you don't have to put up all that margin? That's the first question. And I guess the second question is even more important. Is can the option move far enough between now and expiration to make it worthwhile? And that's the main question you have to ask yourself. And pretty much the only question when it comes to options, you can model it out with all these models. But you know what? Everybody and their brother has those models. So unless you've got some special model that nobody else has, which you probably don't, in this day and age, uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, you might have, and I actually know someone who did, he made $80 million with it. And I know somebody else who had it, uh, a, a model like that. He sold it for, I forget how much, it was in the millions, but he he said it was a billion dollar mistake because he could have traded it on its own and made a lot more money. The people who bought it squeezed the edge out of the market, but those are these are bar. Uh, these are two drink minimum bar stories. So we'll, if we ever get around to having a retreat, we'll sit around and talk about some of these things. So you're looking at how well I did on these days, and you're probably thinking, "Am I awesome or what?" Well, the reality is, there's a lot of days where I got chewed up in between. So I wanted to go back and make darn sure that I did really, really well on the days that I should have done well. But in between, I've got to figure out how to get chewed up a little less. Now, you might be thinking, it doesn't sound like he's got his strategy all figured out. Well, some of this intraday stuff, some of the stuff I've been doing a long time, like COVID gap reversals and sort of the Russian doll, so to speak, I've done that on and off forever. But this ETF stuff is a little newer to me, and it is a work in progress. And as I'm going to mention in a second, somebody was interested in it, what I was doing. And I basically said, well, why don't you check back with me in a year? Let's see where I am. That way we won't create any false expectations because things have been going fairly well lately. Now, the secret to trading is figure out when to trade. And when you get into those nice opening gap reversal situations and you are in a situation where it looks like you're getting expansion of range on those intraday trades, that's a good time likely to be trading. And fortunately, when I see that range expanding intraday, I've been lucky enough on those HG days and those wide range bar days, at least in that particular quick little snapshot, to do okay. But I think the real secret to trading is to figure out when not to trade. Now, if we get back to the prior screen, you, you see I've got a bunch of little indicators on here and stuff, and I'm not a huge fan of indicators. I like to call them illustrators because it just lets me know what's happened in the market and what's going on as opposed to what will happen. And I've done a couple of presentations on all this stuff in here. Basically, this is just the how far the range is from the high, from the lows of 20 bars. And then I've got some ATRs and stuff in here. I used another screen, which I'll show you part of in one second, which also which, uh, shows me another measure of volatility. And then up here, without going into too many de details, this is how many days since we've had an HG7. 
So the longer you go without an HG7, the more likely you are to have one. And an HG7 day, you could usually, if you're on your toes and pay attention, you could usually print money. So I use all those little indicators to try to help me figure out when an HG7 day is due. But one of the simplest things you can do, and this is today's chart, is simply put a line above the high and a line below the low to see if you're having an inside day or just simply eyeball it. And one of the things I've been thinking about is maybe consider no action as long as you're currently on an inside day because you're likely just to get chewed up. Now, I remember, because it was only a few minutes ago, <laughs> but I remember watching the lab you all day and it was all over the place and it just looked like it was going to be this phenomenal opportunity. But when you look at a daily chart and gain a little perspective, and you're not looking at the flickering ticks, as Dave Keller says, and I think he's quoting Todd Harrison, you gain a little bit more perspective and realize that, hey, maybe it's just a range-bound day. So I had no trades in LabU today. Now, Soxel was also an inside day. Now, in this case, it's a little bit more tricky because this is a fairly wide range bar. And by the way, I should have made money on the 21st. Do I have a notebook? If I didn't, shame on me. And that's the thing about trading. You want to just constantly see where you can improve and constantly see how you did. Was that yesterday? Socks out. Yeah, I made a little bit. Yeah, that's a trade I just showed you. Or was it the 22nd? Of today. No, yesterday was 24. Okay, yeah, yeah, I made a little bit, but that's the one I got knocked out of half somehow. So it was better than the Pokemon. Eye. But the the dilemma becomes when you have a wide range bar here, because this range might be wide enough to trade. But nonetheless, you probably want to think about not trading as long as you're having an inside day. Now let's take a look at JNUG. JNUG was a fairly wide range bar. And did I do okay? Yeah, I did okay in Jade Nug yesterday. Looking at that, it's like, a, I'm with these things on the fly going like, wait a minute, did I do okay? <laughs> I didn't set the world on fire. But this is a fairly wide range bar, so it's a bit of a judgment call, but it still, it still was an inside day today, as you can see. And by the way, I'm a little gun shy lately because I've done so well. I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm more saying that out of fear. And what happens is you get a big old huge wide range bar. The next day you get a bit of a shoulder shrug where the market just kind of chops around. And those wide range bars, as I've been pontificating, is when you do exceptionally well with some sort of intraday type of trading because your volatility is there and you get a little trend with it sometimes enough to, to capitalize on. All you need, depending on the instrument, is somewhere between like a 30 or 40 cent move and something like Drip or Lab D might be a little bit bigger. Sox S maybe smaller move like that. I'd have to actually see the chart. But yeah, something like Drip maybe a, a half a point. It's all you need. I mean, you got a thousand shares on. It's five hundred bucks. You know, that's better than a poke in the eye. Now, Drip I was keeping an eye on today and keeping an eye on Gush too, of course. And it was a Inside day for most of the day, but it did kind of peep out above the range. So I said, you know what? If this thing breaks out above the range, especially since Drip has had has had a nice run higher and a little bit of a pullback. And as I told my service peeps last night, I said, boy, if this thing gaps open tomorrow, it's going to be a gift. And unfortunately, it didn't do that. But anyway, I put an entry about 950 and change, 950 something, and it never did trigger all day. And I went about my life, worked on the slides for tonight's presentation. So there was no ETF trades today. Is that me being prudent? To some extent, maybe, probably. And to some extent, as I just said, a little nervous because I caught a couple of wide range bars lately and I'm ready to, I'm not ready to, but I know it's time or getting close to time to pay the piper. Uh, I hopefully I'm a little bit better than I used to be, but it's 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 amazing. I look back and like I'll never do that again. That thing I did last week. But usually after 
I do really well, not only is my ego inflated, but the market is due to stop doing what it was doing while what made me do so well. That's what I'm trying to say there is if it has a huge wide range bar and I do really well, the next day it's going to chop around. Okay. We were fortunate to have, we had like a set, we had several wide range bars since Monday. So knock on wood, it's been pretty good today, notwithstanding, obviously. So the question I'm asking myself, is it me being prudent or I have a client who's very interested in, in, in this ETF stuff and he wants to sort of pay attention to what's going on and he wants me to show him his, my trades. And I texted him late last night and said, you know, why don't you give me a year because I'm still fleshing all this out. Now I do like to show you guys things as I work on them. Because from a selfish standpoint, hey, you'll help me out. And, and the other thing is, it forces me to actually do the work and work a little harder. Like I probably wouldn't have sat down and spent a couple hours looking at how I did on the HG days if I didn't have to do a presentation tonight. I'd probably go off and have some fun or do something, some other kind of fun, right? So I knew he was paying attention to what's going on. And my big fear was I've done so well recently, I'm going to fail miserably as soon as somebody begins to watch me. So part of it was me being prudent and part of it was probably the observer effect. Now, I, I, I've got that term from, I just did a quick Google. I, I know that years ago I read this and I forget what the analogy they were using. But in quantum physics, the particles are really, really small. And I think Heisenberg was the person who, coin this phrase observer effect but anyway when you go to look at them you accidentally kind of move them around and you're saying well this one does this and this one does that but it's really because you're you're creating some sort of energy or some sort of force that's having an effect on that so was i worried about putting on trades and losing money or was i being prudent in not putting on the trades it's probably a little bit of both but as I'm going live, I got to thinking, as I've said a thousand times, because I'm proud of it, and but a lot a lot of good came out of this thing, just a tremendous amount of good, I think, for me and and a lot of the people, I believe. But I was Charlie Kirk had me as guest of honor down in St. Lucia a few years ago. And we had these breakout sessions where I'd spend a half an hour or 45 minutes, which with individuals and we go through things. And one of the guys was struggling a little bit, but he's all on his own. And basically, I told him to, to trade like somebody is watching. And I think that helped him out a lot. And as stupid and crazy as it sounds, especially because I'm in this educational business here, but a lot of times I'll announce my trades out loud and why I'm doing them. And I'll explain why I'm doing them pretending that I'm explaining to somebody live and that actually helps a lot because when you hear yourself sometimes you might sound like an idiot because you're like well I'm just going to wing it and buy this because I ah, the risk isn't that 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 big and it's not a great setup it's, it's so it's kind of hard to say these things out loud and and not sound mediocre now I know that sounds kind of stupid but if there's nobody around you try doing that during the day and you'd be surprised at how many trades you're going to avoid because you're going to think through it and realize that you don't want to look like an idiot and i'm guilty because i'm here i'm here by myself i sweep a lot of bad trades under the rug and sometimes i'm, I'm guilty of taking that that trade for recreational purposes you know for entertainment purposes and that's a very dangerous thing to do and one thing that i'm kind of thinking about here is i have one client as i've said many many times he does incredibly well and he's very smart and he's an incredible trader and as i've told him a thousand times if we could just figure out how to bottle it up we do great but he comes off the rails or he comes off the rails every now and then and just sort of begins that recreational trading and gets himself into a lot of trouble. And I told him, I was like, look, you know what you're doing. What if you explain to your wife, especially something like my trading service, which is all mapped out. 
and you said, hey, we're going to follow this Dave Landry guy and, and you know, maybe show our last week's presentation where it failed miserably for a few months and then all of a sudden began to kind of print money. And that's how momentum works. You will lose a little money over a period of time and kind of grind it out and hopefully at least barely keep your head above the water in those times. But through the money management, through being prudent, through waiting for entries, through not micromanaging and all these other things that are preached and through taking those partial profits and trailing those stops higher, over the long run, you're going to do really well. But explain to your wife, say, hey, babe, you know, we, we probably will lose a little money in this. I would almost expect to lose a little money, but longer term, we'll catch these trends and tell her a little bit about how trends work as much as she'll suffer a fool gladly, right? Anyway, long story endless, after I told him that, he says, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So he knew, and that's kind of the, the thing about trading psychology I talk about so often, is you know when you're doing something wrong. So I think by accident, I'm kind of backing into something here. I think you need to dance like no one is watching. But, <laughs> but make sure you trade like somebody is and announce your trades out loud and, and explain them and then of course document everything so maybe you should trade like someone is watching now speaking of trading or not trading i grabbed a snapshot from the portfolio this is actually live as of the close today and you notice that for symbol i have none and when I put a symbol in there for a potential setup, like all the ones up here at one point were potential setups, because this is the live portfolio, obviously. But I put none when there's nothing to do. And as I'm going live, I notice it's like, wait a minute, 714. So since 714, I have not recommended any new action. Now, some days I might have three or four down here for new trades. But it made me realize that, wow, it's it's been what? It's over a week or more where no new trades were recommended. We're going on the second week here. But that's okay. Because if I'm not gonna if I don't see anything that's worth trading for the core methodology, then I don't think you should be trading anything either. And another story that I've said <laughs> ad nauseum. So I've been doing nothing all day, mostly nothing. I'll show you a few things that I've been doing other than that intraday stuff. Anyway, the other story that I've said ad nauseum where I learned a lot about human nature is back in the trading markets days when my service was started, sort of by accident. That's another long story in and of itself. But anyway, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't come into trading saying, I'm going to start a trading service and get in the educational business. That all happened by accident. I also ended up, ended up with a hedge in a hedge fund by accident. So it's just a lot of nice little accidents have have uh, happened throughout the years. But I, I do believe in the laws of attraction, putting yourself out there and things like that. But anyway, the point is, I haven't done a whole lot with the core methodology lately, because other than wait and maybe a, a Russian doll or two, like we talked about last week. But as I've said a thousand times, back in the trading markets days, there were salesmen that would sell my service and they got a commission. And whenever I would not recommend anything, sales would begin to plummet. And when I, not purposely, but just didn't work out, when I had bad setups, a string of bad setups, it happens, fell with a sign on SH, right? I wouldn't really lose clients and they would beg me the salesman that is to put stocks on I'm like no I'm not going to I'm not going to succumb to that I'm just going to wait until I find something that I like and put them on the trading service now I have been doing a few things lately here's an IPO I talked about in the Facebook group and I just want to point out this for a couple of reasons one it's a very 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 simple pattern this thing is so simple I'm shocked that it actually works. I know I'm showing you more advanced things here with the, with the volatility compression expansion, the HG days and all this. 
But I also want to bring it back to show you that something really, really simple can work. Well, I guess it really hasn't worked yet, so we'll see. But it's worked in the past. And the buy a B pattern, we're just looking for brand new IPO. We're looking for five days of trading at least. And on that fifth day, if it's a new closing high, which is also above the day one high, should that day one high hit the high for the week? So we have one, two, three, four, five days. As you can see, day three took out the day one high. So the day one high day rule is no longer in effect. So we just need to close above the day three high. And we got that yesterday. Now, here's where it's a little bit tricky. As I've said before, I kind of like a little bit more definitive close. And I don't know if it was intuition i always said i would do a presentation and not use that term from med Dakota, but i guess tonight's not going to be it or into wishing but i just felt like this stock had the potential to go and i think i entered this one in after hours because i wanted to make sure it at least triggered but it didn't trigger by much so the point i'm trying to make is if you showed me this and say dave i didn't take that because it really didn't have a definitive trigger like you occasionally say i would say I agree with you, okay? Now, the other reason I want to show it too is in the IPO course, I also talked about the buy at B plus one, where it seems like if you wait until the next day after you get a, a day five signal, that's also a good day to buy in to the IPOs. So if you miss this day here you can look to get in on possibly an intraday rally as opposed to waiting all the way to the close so that's just a little fodder for research something you want to check out and when i did the ipo course i looked at i don't know how many but probably hundreds if not thousands of ipos and there seems to be an edge in day six as there is in day five but day five seems to be a little bit better edge as you can see so far knock on wood i've gotten a head start to a decent trade here we'll see how it shakes out here's another one ironically same sort of situation day one day two day three day four and today was day five and i did get in this one and i'll show you the actual trades next week if you like and there's another case where just kind of barely triggered and I don't know about you guys, but whenever, especially because you're by yourself, whenever you're trading, you just all these questions in your head. It's like, am I trading this, even though it's not a great definitive trigger, am I trading this because I haven't gotten a lot of action in the IPOs and the core methodology lately, or is this a bona fide signal that I really should take? And I say you can kind of go either way with this. Maybe wait for day six. So day six would be tomorrow. Let's see how it shakes out. Maybe you dodge a bullet by missing this really tiny in, uh, entry here if you squint your eyes. So keep an eye on this one. Let's just see how it shakes out, and I'll follow up on it in upcoming shows. And by the way, as I often say, my goal is to not show you anything that one I wouldn't do, and number two to try to show you things ahead of time. So these two were brought up in Facebook, either when I was contemplating them or right at the, about the time I was getting in. With the buy at B, you don't know until the close. So, so there's only a few minutes difference sometimes between those two things. So again, trigger question mark. And I know one of you guys out there, I don't know if you're here tonight, but uh, David, W, if you're here, you do a lot of uh, research on this. I know you got some research I haven't looked at, and my apologies, it's just been slammed. But if you want to take a look at that day five versus day six and get back to me, if you don't mind sharing that, uh, let me know. Now, I have a, a friend of mine who's also a distant in law, and every now and then, he's a little older gentleman, and every now and then, he's my father. He's my brother. No, he's my brother in law's father in law, if that makes any sense. Every now and then, he'll call me and we'll talk a little bit about markets. And uh, he's a silver bug and he's collected a lot of silver over his lifetime. And I find that kind of interesting. And anyway, 
So he does have a an interest in markets. And I remember him saying a few years back, and he said it just a couple of days ago to me because he was calling me about an inflation theme, which I talked about, I think, in the stock chart show. If not, I'll bring it up next week. And we'll talk about it. And his, his observation is that markets top on high volatility. So I'm going to kill this bird with two stones, uh, <laughs> as the Cajuns say. Last week, I mentioned the my multiple volatility indicators, and all this is is just a bunch of HVs. And it's they named it Landry Volatility because they were doing the coding for me over at Stock Charts. But this is just historical volatility, so I don't get credit for creating this, but they did put Landry on it. And I like to plot multiple volatilities. This is in the ACP platform. If you have stock charts, if you like this video, you'll get ACP for free. That's all you have to do. And last week I mentioned this casually, this multiple volatility indicators. And this is something that I'm noodling with to try to figure out when these ETFs are due to make a sizable move and I can get it on an intraday basis. Again, I'm here anyway. Might as well capitalize on it if I can. But the thing that I was telling this gentleman is it may seem like they top on high volatility, but markets in general tend to top on low volatility. Now, the problem with trying to time off of that is it could stay low for a long, long, long time. And of course, we always use price. But you look at this and you see this big spike in volatility and you think, OK, well, it looks like a market did top on high volatility. Now, one thing, again, use price, but if memory serves, we've got a 10%, a TFM 10% sell signal right around here. And if you look at the stock chart show I did yesterday, I talked a little bit about the TFM 10% system. And I also put up a post in Facebook of that chart a couple of days ago, same chart. So you can go in and look exactly when the sell signals were. But by the time we got that sell signal, you could see that volatility had already begun to take off and take off fairly significantly. So what I'm kind of backing into here is markets do top on low volatility, but maybe as my brother-in-law's father-in-law is pointing out, maybe that increase of volatility happens as the market is beginning to roll over. So maybe that's something we need to pay attention to. And I'm just kind of, and this is why I love teaching because I learn as I go. So maybe years ago I had a pattern called the trend thrust. I don't know if it still works or not. It's been many years since I've even looked at it, but I'm trying to think, of, I can't even remember how it works. I think it was a three day moving average or five day moving average on the trend indicator, which uh, developed by uh, Dick Arms, which he's no longer with us. And he's uh, he was a great guy. I knew him personally. Uh, but anyway, through the AAPTA, you meet all these guys. Uh, anyway, great guy, but I was able to take his indicator many, many years ago and then use some sort of thrust indicator, like if it jumped so much, then that would give you a signal. It'd be fun to kind of dig out that, that system and see if it still works. If somebody's interested, we could find it somewhere. It might have been in Dave Landry on swing trading. I'll have to go in and find that. But anyway, along those lines, just thinking out loud here, as I'm seeing this, it's like seeing it for the first time, maybe these big thrust and volatility, because look how tight they are here, and then look at this big thrust up in volatility, the delta, maybe the delta can help predict, predict price movement. But of course, as usual, make sure you actually have the price movement too. So we're getting a bit of a, if we have time, we'll look at an S&P 500 and we'll see what kind of spike we're getting in that volatility. All right, any questions on all that? All right, we're gonna jump into the live chart. So if you wanna start asking about individual stocks, please start doing so now. Just hit return again after each ticker, so I make sure I cover each one that you ask. So before we get to the live charts, if you like this video, please like it, okay? If you don't like it, then go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> I'm half kidding www.youtube slash C slash Dave Landry is my channel if you're looking for it. So subscribe to it while you're there. The other thing, just real quick, if you want to see a lot of the setups mentioned in addition to the Facebook group, obviously, which is behind, which you have to be a gold member of DaveLandry.com at least for that. 
but you can review the archives through my trading services for free. If you're on the service, you just look down below the service, obviously. But if you're not on a trading service, you can go to here and check them out and you'll see all everything I've ever recommended, warts and all. It's might be a little boring, but I think it's a good exercise. Look at it, look at as many as you can stand because you'll get my thought process and you can see where sometimes it pans out and I do phenomenal and sometimes not so much. And you know what? That's just trading and that's how it works. Okay, what I'm gonna do real quick, I'm gonna go in. I wanna like to the start over. I am going to hop into the charts and I want to show you what's happening in the market and some sectors, and then we'll get to those individual stock picks and any other questions that may arise. Now we'll pull up the S&P 500. Let me see if I can get it up in background so we'll have it ready. I'll go over to the ACP module and spiders might work. Yeah, that'd be fine. Just I'll pull the spiders in background. In fact, I got them good, ready to go. So you can see that we obviously had this little bit of a spill in here, and then we had we also had this gap lower, which is weird because usually the spiders gives you a true gap. I, again, I don't think we recovered that much. I don't know why we had that tick like that. But getting back to the P's, pretty sharp retracement in here, and we went well below the 30-day EMA. Nothing magical about that but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market if you're using something like the Landry light, which we've had quite a bit of until a few days ago, and now we're getting some Landry light again. I'll pull that up too in just one second. One thing that I was pointing out in the stock chart show is that the trigger for the TFM 10% system is a ways away, and I'll pull up a live chart and show you that in one second. So according to that system, the market is still okay. And part of the thinking, or 90% of the thinking, I guess, or most of the thinking of the TFM 10% system is if a market's going to lose half of its value, it's going to lose 10% of its value first. So once a market loses from its high, at least S&P 500, in a more volatile market, that 10% number might be a little bigger might be a little smaller in something like bonds. But in a, in a market with fairly low HV, I say fairly low, it, it doesn't feel low when you're in the middle of one of these <laughs> adverse market moves, but 10% seems to be a pretty good number. HV on the P's is about 12 right now. I see to the HV. Anyway, as of today, with today's closing here, I should say, we're less than a half percent away from all-time high. So when a market is at or near all-time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. Same thing goes for the NASDAQ. We did have a little nasty spill in here, but the market turned right back up, as I've been saying quite a bit in one of my stock charts videos on YouTube. <laughs> Somebody said, every time you get all worried and cautious, I make the most amount of money. And basically, I don't think he was being nice. I think he was saying that I was wrong when the market begins to sell off. Well, the only point I was making in the, during these sell-offs is, hey, let's just pull in our horns a little bit. Let's get a little cautious. And the reason this gentleman makes money is because longer term, the market's been doing pretty well. And if you ignore some of these sell-offs, it just bounces right back and just turns out that it was a correction or a pullback, however you want to see it. Just remember, that'll work until they don't. So you have to use stops, and you can't just blindly buy a market every time it dips. The NASDAQ still looking pretty good in here. We're back above the moving average. It's just shy of all-time highs. In fact, I think we're about a third of a percent away, if I remember from my analysis earlier. Yeah, exactly. Look at that. One th look, you like Tony Hills here. Look, look, look how close we are. That's huge. <laughs> so Russell 2000, a little bit different story. We still have a bow tie here. An aggressive entry would have triggered today, as I think I said in the market in a minute, and my service, I know. A less aggressive entry will be down here above the below the first day of the signal. 
Now, we're not that far away from all-time highs, so I wouldn't rush out and sell the form based on this action, but it, it does still have me concerned, or it does have me concerned, and I've been concerned for a while, as you know, about the Russell. Energy's not looking so hot. We got a bow tie down. So far, we got a little bit of a pullback, so it looks like they're due to make a new leg lower. Metals and mining have been performing poorly, but on a relative strength basis, they are a little bit stronger than the energies. And then all it would take would be a little bit of a pop to get back above these moving averages. So I wouldn't get too bearish on the energies, but I, I mean, I'm on the metals and mining, but I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy them as long as they're generally continuing to head lower. Gold and silver have been sort of helping to push the energies lower. And it's kind of counterintuitive that, hey, we're gonna have all this inflation. <laughs> There's no inflation. Yeah, the cream that I put in my coffee is $7.49 for a little thing that big. And my wife was complaining. I'm like, I'm just going to treat my, I'm sorry, I'm going to treat myself to that. If it's got to come out of my trading account, I'm not giving up my cough, my cream for my coffee. This stuff is great. You pour it and it's like, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> gee, I wonder why he's so fat. <laughs> Take a look at foods. Foods is a defensive area. Speaking of foods, notice that they banged out some new lows today, not with a whole lot of vigor, but down to eh, almost 1%. As you can see down below the bow tie moving averages, 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential. Banks turned back down. As you can see, they remain in the downtrend. Bow tied recently have been selling off out of that bow tie. I like to look at bow ties off of all time highs and all-time lows. Hopefully, we'll, we'll never see an all-time low in the stock market ever again. But in the stock market, maybe a five-year low or a 10-year low if you're looking at something like a bow tie on the downside. On the upside, ideally, all-time highs. Speaking of all-time highs, insurance bow tie down off all-time all highs. So far, a little downtrend remains in, intact there. Real estate just hit all-time highs yesterday, backing off a little today. In general, you could see remaining in a pretty serious uptrend. Drugs have been mostly sideways as of late, but they're trying to push back toward the old high, so that's certainly a good thing. Biotech not performing so well, kind of wide and loose and all over the place, so biotech not so much. Health services on the upside, just shy of all-time highs. So far, so good there. And as you go through these, you'll see some areas kind of sideways. Leisure still looks toppy in here, although it's it's really pushing back into its moving averages. Retail looking pretty good, brand new highs today. So if you are getting anything out of this, hopefully you're seeing that the market is still pretty mixed. Take a look at transports, bow tie, top remains in place there. Back to the upside, software, bam, winning. Brand new highs, okay? Tiny Elvis market. Look at it, look at that trend, it's huge. Semiconductors kind of all over the place. Yesterday pushed really hard, higher. Today, the little inside day we talked about earlier. Same thing happened with this indicator, this um, MG group here. Not too far away from all-time highs, but kind of wide and loose and kind of hard to get excited about buying semiconductors at this juncture. And if you look at some of these mixed areas in here, especially if you look at like the Russell overall, you realize why we're not seeing a whole lot of setups as trend followers. And that's okay. And learning how to sit on your hands is very, very, very important. Let me pop over to ACP real quick and show you a couple of things there. And let's take a look at those. Uh, let's take a look at the S&Ps or the P's and see if there's something worth while as far as the volatility is concerned. Okay. So here's ACP, and if anybody knows if I could share a template, let me know. Let me know. I, I did email stock charts, but they're pretty busy over there, so I don't fault them for not getting right back to me. This is the screen that I like to use when I'm studying ETFs. Let's take a look at like SoxL, for instance. And I like to see where the HVs are. I have it necessarily figured out anything just yet, but if they're super low, then maybe the HV is due to expand. In other words, the price is due to expand. 
And then down here, and I need to ask them about this because the scaling isn't always perfect, but I've got a one day average true range and a 10 day average true range. So I want to see if the range is getting bigger or smaller. And I don't know, fully baked is the right word, but this research is, hasn't been completed. It's just something that I'm working on to figure out if there's something that I can glean from predicting price with volatility, or I just need an expansion in price. So if we take out, let's take out this bottom ATR, if I can make it go away. Do, do, do. Oh, here we go. Okay. So what I was saying earlier was, and the aforementioned gentleman was talking about Dow Jones. So I thought it'd be kind of cool just to pull up the diamonds to see what's happening with the volatility. And, and I sent him that chart going back in time. Volatility is kind of all over the place, but yeah, you could see that we did have this spike in volatility recently, but the market is almost at all time highs. Okay. So these spikes, are they a predictor of volatility? I don't know. How far do they have to go? Like the volatility thrust we talk, talked about earlier. I don't know, but that would be something and it's something that hopefully we could pick this up in the Facebook group. And if you want to leave a comment down below, if you do a little studying on this, it'd be great. And we can noodle with it a little bit further. But this is the multiple volatility indicators. And we're just trying to see where volatility is. And it, there is a bit of an ebb and flow in here. As it compresses, you know you're getting ready to get a expansion in volatility. And the other thing, just real quick, Let's take a look at like the S&P 500. And then let me just put in, so something really simple like Landry Light with the 30 EMA. And all this does is as long as the market is above the 30 EMA, it ticks off a bar, okay? This is not, magnitude i tricked up a lot of people in the quiz section on my website for landry light it's this is simply the number of days but i like it in a histogram like this so i could see hey it's been a long time since we've been above that since it's been a long time since the lows have been above the moving average when you start getting a lot of red you need to start paying attention what's kind of fascinating and i'm just kind of noticing this i would assume we would have had more but we didn't get any downside daylight on this last little spill. It doesn't mean the market is A-OK. -okay. The internal action has me a little nervous. But once you start getting a lot of downside daylight, or Landry light as we now call it, then you need to become a little bit concerned. So as you can see, that would be one bar, two bar, three bars. You can see it's illustrated down here. So after quite a few bars of Landry light, you need to start paying attention because maybe, just maybe, you're in a downtrend. As long as it's green, you're probably okay. Still honor your stops, still take your partial profits and all the other good stuff. But you can worry a little bit less about the market. So if we go in and the prop, both sides proper order will be another one, FYI. Same sort of action, okay? If it's green, the market's probably okay. If it's yellow, you want to get a little cautious. And this is the plugin. Just click down here, like the video, and then click down here and you'll have access. So that's the bow tie. It's another good little indicator. We had the bow tie signal back here, if y'all remember. And I think somewhere I was doing live updates all through this pandemic crash where I pointed out the signals as they occurred. And if somebody needs that link, let me know and I can see if I can dig it out of my website. Hopefully I won't have to do that for a long time, but sometimes it happens. So this is the only other thing I want to show you real quick. This is a TFM 10% system. And again, go in and watch the stock chart show, which will be on my website on July 22nd on the homepage. 
And if you sign up for the free area, you should get more and more of these shows too. You'll have access to more and more of them. But anyway, the 10% line is right here, what I call the buy line. And then the 50 day or 50 weeks simple moving average is right here. So you can see based on the magnitude of the run we've had, this market would have to drop quite a bit to get a sell signal. Now what's fascinating, as I've said a thousand times, is we got a weekly sell signal, the, the thrust lower was so big, we got a weekly sell signal before we got a daily sell signal in something like the bow tie. So that was a really scary time. And my friends begin to freak out a little bit and I warned them that this is ugly. I don't like the way it looks. And they held on, held on, held on, held on, held on. And then they're down 30% and they come crying to me. And they continue to hold on and the market came right back. And they were thinking like, oh, that David is market timing. What an idiot. You just hold on. <laughs> It'll just come back. No, I don't, Danny. Uh, all right. Uh, any other questions? All this stuff. I'm kind of all over the place tonight, but so much, so much to show you, and so little time. All right. Let's hop back into the the TC. Paul wants to know about Jo. That's going to be Joe. Wow. That's coffee. I've never traded this ETF, but look at that. It's it's melting up in here. Look at that trend. It's huge. You can't trade, you can't just jump in blindly in a, in, in a market like this, okay? I mean, if you had the guts, maybe, it, it looks like it's kind of too late now, but maybe, and I don't know how a trading halt would affect you. George says, best show ever. Thank you. I, you know, I tell you, I, it's like my wife's always like, how'd the show go? I was like, I don't know, I rambled a lot. I think I pulled it all together, but I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you, George. I appreciate that. George is in the Facebook group. You know, maybe if you really felt like you had to do something like this, maybe try to a little opening range breakout a la Toby Crable, okay? And maybe play that intraday. I would just be really scared to jump into a market like this that's going straight up, really, really dangerous. But Paul, thanks for pointing that out, okay? Oh, good for you, Paul. <laughs> All right, party at Paul's house. Paul says, I've been long for a while. Always good info. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's easy to trade KC futures and, and TS. What's TS, John? Trade station? Yeah, KC is, is uh, coffee. Okay, yeah, and trade station, he's saying. Yeah, I had trade station years ago before they were brokerage. Show you how old I am. Had the little dongle thing you had to put on the back. <laughs> If you dongle with dad, you had to like find one from China. I'm not breaking the law. I'm a dongle with dad. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's, it's a sentence you don't want out of context, huh? <laughs> Any more stocks? Zim, bow tie. Yeah, yeah, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a bow tie to the downside. I almost showed this one tonight as a potential short in my trading service. Shippers can be kind of crazy, and my concern is that it's a relatively new issue, okay? And I guess we have a little support down here, but yeah, I, I'll give you kind of a high five on that one because I think it's the top. And the reason this is not in the landed list tonight is it does have adequate volume. I just figured it wasn't a great idea to rush out and short a relatively new issue. On top of that, the shippers can be really, 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 really crazy. I was long this one not too long ago. I think, did we have this one in the service? I think we did. I know I had it held on for quite a while. But yeah, it's it's a, it's not a perfect bow tie, but yeah, it's a bow tie for all intents and purposes. And it's an inverted cup and handle. It's a top. So good eye on that one, George. But I'm not going to go after it personally. Pulte or PLTR? PLTR, that's not Pulte. Um, what do you want to do with that? Um, remember, as I said earlier, I like bow ties up all time highs. Yeah, there's really nothing for me to trade here. Uh, I suppose if you zoomed it in, it would look more like a short. Yeah, good eye on that. Shorter term, it looks like it's in trouble. But if you back the chart way out, I just would prefer 
like a bow tie off all time highs. One other thing to be careful with on the short side, I'm trying to think of a big stodgy company. Like I was short Pulte for a while, or was it? Yeah, it was Pulte. Something like Pulte, they're not splitting the atom, they're building homes. HV's not too whack, okay? And some of these, these big stodgy companies are kind of priced for perfection. They're efficient move, uh, efficient stocks for the most part, but when they begin to sell off, they become inefficient. And on the short side, it's kind of just the opposite of the long side. I look for a little bit more efficient stock where everybody and their brother's already in it and there's plenty of volume and look to catch that rollover. So I'd much rather short a home builder or something than some sort of technology company or a biotech where they can announce something tomorrow that could really hurt you. IWF, IWM. Yeah, the IWF, as I think you pointed out last week, Craig, is the growth Russell. So the growth Russell's doing pretty good. And maybe I need to start paying more attention to that because the IWM is not looking so hot. But this certainly looks pretty darn good. Boy, it kind of makes me want to rush out and put the TFM 10% system on this thing and then forget about it. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up again. Appreciate it. Okay, FUV for bow tie long. Well, no, because, well, the bow tie wasn't off all time lows, but I hear you. Okay, like back here, you had your bow tie. And I think, if memory serves, we did trade it back then. I hope we did. I seem to remember it. But yeah, it looked okay back here. This wasn't off all time lows. It's such a volatile stock, though. I hear you. It made a nice little pullback, took off. With a little money management, you might have made a little money. I personally would not have traded it then. But yeah, it's not really a bow tie anymore. It's kind of wide and loose and sideways. HV over 100, so be darn careful whatever you do, but I think I'd pass. Yeah, Fit B, John, I don't know if you're on this. I don't know which John you are. We got a couple of Johns in here. Are you John Z or another John? But yeah, if it's John Z, as you know, oh, John B, okay. We uh, we had this as a short forever and it never did trigger <laughs> on a service. And that's one of the perverse things. It's like as soon as you give up, it takes off. But yeah, if you traded this bow tie here. Now, remember earlier I was saying I like bow ties at all time highs. Look at that. Look at look at that bow tie. It's huge. Tiny Elvis, right? So I like a bow tie off of all time highs. You got an inverter cup at hand, you got a bow tie. So of course, as soon as we stopped looking at this when I took it off the radar, because with shorts, I like them to trigger fast, because that means that most of the non people on the wrong side of the market. Um I think it's still in a downtrend. I wouldn't take it as a new setup right now, but you certainly would be better off shorting it than going long. Small cap growth still trending. Yeah, you're right, Craig. I agree. I agree. And I'm glad you pointed that out. And that's why in last week's show, I was talking about Dave Keller is really good about pointing these things out in the final bar. <laughs> I called it the final bell last week, the final bar. And uh, I don't know if he's, they keep threatening to go live. Anybody know if he's live yet? Because I need to start watching him if he's live. But yeah, you'll pick up a lot of those things. You'll learn a lot. He was head of um, technical analysis charts for Fidelity for quite a few years. Yeah, BUG, there's a growth index. I, I hear you. So the growth, according to certain indices and ETFs, is doing pretty good. You bought puts. Would you buy puts on? Right, I hit delete. August 209s. Would you buy puts in? Oh, Fit B? Okay. August 209. What's that? Okay, so Dave Keller was live yesterday. Cool. August 20. You bought August 20s? What'd you pay for those, if you don't mind me asking? 10 cent? How much you buy? Like 500? <laughs> they expire in August 20 or you bought the 20 strike? Wow, that's going to be fun to watch. Okay, expiration. All right, gotcha. What's your strike? 33? 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know that that certainly could that certainly could work. The short side could be pretty frustrating if you could buy some puts on kind of a. It's probably not a throwaway throwaway trade because they probably weren't that cheap. You paid twenty cents. No way. Really? That seems that seems hard to believe. Wow. For thirty three and a half, thirty five cents. I need to look at those. What well, heck? That sounds like a. I see earlier I told you watch that S and G trading, but you know, thirty five cents. I could buy ten of them and sweep it under the rug. Well, that's kind of an interesting uh, move. I, I like the way you think. Yeah, because the short side, it's 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 so tricky. It's like we've been short DHI forever. It's all over the place, you know. It's just really, really, really tricky. And a lot of times the short side absolutely implodes and you're feeling great and then all of a sudden it goes straight back up. But if you're trading options, a little bit different, you can play them a little bit differently. You could do something like, for instance, you pay 20 cents for those options. Well, and now they're 35 cents. Well, why not, especially if you bought a shit ton of them, why not flip out half of them at 40 cents, get your money back and then enjoy the ride should the thing implode. But yeah, this stock definitely looks like it's in trouble. You know, that's the problem with options. You got to get uh, timing right, volatility right, <laughs> magnitude right, price right, all kinds of things. But sometimes they could be wonderful. Yeah, and, you know, an option like that, if you're only paying 20 cents for it or something, uh, I just put a limit order in, forget about it, you know, for half. And then that way you get a free position. And that's one of the other secrets to trading. Is that if you can figure out figure out a way to get a free position, and I do that as you know through the swing trades. If I can get a swing trade out, and make one percent. So on a hundred k account, I'm getting a swing trade out, make a thousand dollars. As you saw in that portfolio earlier, the ones that are in white are the swing trades. So if we can make a thousand dollars on a swing trade, and then have that stop at break even, then we have a free position or a free rolling, so to speak, as Charlie Kirk calls it. And he looked at my money management. Okay, any any other stocks? Any other questions? Yeah, I need a little plug out to my stock charts, people. They sent me a cup, so I'll brand the shit. <laughs> All right, I want to thank everybody for coming. I had a blast tonight, and I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Looks like most people here in the Facebook group, so I'll see you tomorrow. Everyone else, we'll see you next week, God willing.